two o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Katie Silk. I'm the local history librarian from Appleton Public Library here in Wisconsin. Um, we're just south of Green Bay for those who are outside of our area and not sure where Appleton is. Um, I'm excited for you guys to join us for our Find Your Ancestors uh, presentation today. Um, thanks to the popularity that we've gained during the pandemic, Find Your Ancestors is now a monthly series, and we've been able to really do it virtually and gain a really big audience. Um, so I just want to thank the Friends of the Appleton Public Library and Appleton Public Library for allowing us to provide this series and to expand it. Um, it used to be something we only offered five or six months a year um, during the year, and now we can offer it every month. So I'm excited for what speakers we have coming yet this year, and I'm already starting to plan for 2022. Um, I just have a couple of quick announcements before we get started with today's presentation. I just want to let you know our next Find Your Ancestors series is going to be on August 14th, and it is on the family black sheep and how to research those ancestors that maybe aren't, uh, you know, the best of people. Maybe they were in jail a little bit or, or things like that. And our speaker is going to be Judy Russell, who is the legal genealogist, if you aren't familiar with that name. She is an awesome speaker. If you have not attended any of her presentations, she is very, very knowledgeable, and I know you guys will enjoy it. Um, there is a link to the handout that I'm going to post a couple times, and there is a link to register for that um, August 14th presentation. It's going to be a, be a virtual only presentation. Um, and then our September one, September 11th, is going to be on Irish genealogy. And we're actually going to allow local attendees to attend live and in person in the library. Um, but we're also going to stream it over Zoom. So you have the option to attend virtually if you're not in the Appleton area. And again, links to register for those programs are in your handout. Um, also, for those who are local, next month, the library is going to be hosting a traveling exhibit um, with some Wisconsin immigrant stories that um, Wisconsin immigrants from Colombia, Honduras, Mexico, and Uruguay, and it's called Immigrant Journeys from South of the Border. And we're going to have that at the library from August 16th to the 28th. So I definitely encourage you guys to check that out if you have any Southern immigrants. We're also working on a couple of other programs um, for Hispanic Heritage Month, which runs mid-September to mid-October. Um, so definitely stay tuned and see what else we have coming up. If you need any help um, with any library databases or you have any genealogy questions we aren't able to answer today, you can feel free to send me an email and we can set up a virtual meeting or an in-person meeting if you're local. And I'm happy to kind of talk through your genealogy, pro genealogy problems and, and see if I can solve them for you. I also encourage you to check out our YouTube channel where we have um, some of our past Find Your Ancestors programs on there, as well as one on how to research your house history and a couple other cool adult programs. Um, today's session we're going to be recording and I'll be posting that on our YouTube channel if you need to go back and um, rewatch any part of it or if you missed part of it, I'll be sure to send an email to everyone um, in a few days once, that po once that's posted on YouTube. There is a handout for today's session, like I said, um, I'm posting the link in the chat right now, and I'll post it again a few times throughout just for those people who are joining us a little bit late. Um, if you have any questions during today's session, you can use the Q&A box. Um, it's located on the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer those questions um, a few times. We kind of have a couple of sections of today's presentation where we'll stop um, and, uh, and do any questions before we move on to the next section. Uh, otherwise, we'll try to answer questions at the end. Uh, we also have a short survey, which is um, from Project Outcome, which is the American Library Association initiative. Uh, we're just kind of looking for some feedback on what you thought of the presentation, and it helps us um, plan for future topics and presentations. Um, like I said, I'm getting started on 2022 speakers, so if you have topics that you'd like to see, definitely let me know in the survey, and I will see what I can do. Um, there is a link to the survey in the handout, and it also is going to pop up after you close out of the Zoom. Just a short question, um, eight question survey. So I would appreciate any feedback. Now we can go on to today's presentation. Uh, today we're going to be talking about finding your German ancestors with maps and gazetteers. Our speaker today is John Wasserstraff. John, he is a retired software engineer and mathematics teacher from Beloit, Wisconsin. All of his great grandparents and both grandfathers immigrated from Germany in the 19th century. Um, but DNA surprisingly shows that he's both German and Scandinavian. Uh, John has also discovered the hometowns of all of these families. 
and he is currently the president of the German Interest Group of Wisconsin, and he leads their annual genealogy workshop, um, and he's done that for several years. He's also been able to, he's been able to share um, what he has learned about finding hometowns with various groups in the Beloit area, and he's happily to be able to do that again today with all of our uh, attendees today. So welcome, John. Thank you, Katie. Um, let me see if I can share here. Okay, how's that look? You seeing that? Looks great. Okay, excellent. Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're able to come and uh, participate today. And I hope I can uh, give some stuff that will help you uh, using, especially with gazetteers. So my presentation is gonna be in three parts. First part's kind of an introduction. Why do we need maps and gazetteers, what they are and what we can get out of them. And then the second part is really the heart of the presentation. I'm going to show you the three main tools. And I hope that uh, by the end of that section, you'll be able to know what they are and, and what you can get out of them and maybe a little bit about using them. And then as we have time at the end, I'll quickly run through and show you a bunch of other things that uh, you might find useful too in this regard. So the first part, I'll share the as I used here. Uh, McMillan has been a speaker at our German interest group uh, workshop. And I see during the pandemic, she's been very popular on uh, Zoom meetings. And so I used two of her webinars for research. These are on legacy family tree. And to get those, you need to be a member or uh, pay the fee. And these two are really good webinars. If you want more information, uh, I recommend you try those. And then I also uh, use three free YouTube webinars uh, by uh, James Tanner. And these were from uh, BYU Family History YouTube Library. And you can find those if you do that Google that I've got listed there. So the links to all five of these webinars are in the handout. So this is the advice from these experts. Maps are genealogical tools. And I should add gazetteers too. And Mr. Tanner says searching in the wrong place is the number one issue for genealogists who can't find an ancestor, all right? If you don't know where to look, you're probably not gonna be able to find them. So that's why it's absolutely essential to locate everything. When you have a record or an event, you need to associate the place with that event or person. So if you know the location of the event, it suggests what records you can find and differentiates individuals you're probably gonna find a lot of Jim Smith. So having the location for your Jim Smith can help you find him. And it also resolves mysteries about what things happened and why they might've happened if you know the location. So a key step for any research is to identify where a particular event occurred. So make sure you get that included in your records because records are created at or near the place where the event occurs. You wanna use primary sources. So you wanna go back to the time and place where the event happened to find the, the best record. So Mr. Tanner's first rule is work backwards from the first absolutely known location. And I'll start with what you know, and, and work backwards. Connect things by location and by context. So don't skip around in your tree. You're gonna wander off into the wilderness. And the second rule is always record the location as it was at the time of the event. And that's one of the main 
takeaways I hope you get from this talk is that locations, place names, jurisdictions change over time. So it's very important to know the lo location at the time of the event. What was the name of that location at that time? So here's a hint, uh, if you're using Google, you should always identify the places starting from the smallest to the largest jurisdiction. So for example, you want to start with a house or farm, if you know that, the parish, the county, the state, province, or district, and then the nation, small to large. That is the best order for finding things in Google and uh, other genealogical stuff. Okay. And you need to remember that jurisdictions and borders are not fixed permanently. They change over time. And here's an example Mr. Tanner gave. <clears throat> he was researching a family that had a whole bunch of kids. And some of them were born in Kentucky and some of them were born in Tennessee. And he was confused about, well, why was this family keep moving around every time a kid was born? Well, it turned out <coughs> they were right on the border shown here. And there was a surveyor's error and, and the boundary changed over the course of the uh, family's lifetime. So important point, remember that the boundaries do change. So I'm a science and math person. Uh, theory of relativity involves space time. So it's important that you tie a name both to the date and the place. If you have one or the other, you're not, uh, don't have a complete identification of your event or person. So what are the steps that you need to take in using maps and gazetteers? The first item is you need to discover a potential place name. And I want to emphasize potential, right? The first name you come across probably is not exactly right. There's a spelling place or a name change or something. So remember, it's a potential name. So you want to take that potential name and then find an actual historic location that matches up with that. So you match that location with the current name. And if you got the current name, then you can use that to find out the locations for the archives for those records. And then finally, you can get around to doing the actual research. So how do you find the potential name? This involves detective work and uh, you gotta use your wits and uh, your sleuthing skills. So here's some of the most common ones. I, I use German to America. You can use your immigration records, ship uh, passenger lists, uh, histories, biographies, vital statistics, and then your family stuff, obituaries, Bibles, and of course census. I think we've all used the census. So of course there's many other things. So I'm not gonna get into that today, but that's your first task, get the potential name. And then uh, let's talk about, you thought, you think your German, your ancestor was German. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, if you look at ancestry DNA or one of the others, that DNA goes way back to the German tribes in Roman days. You know, that tells you the area, but it might not be real helpful in finding your village. Uh, language, remember that German was not spoken in what it was just Germany then or now, it was spoken in Australian empire and there were German colonies all over in the Russia and elsewhere. So just because they spoke German, that doesn't mean they were from what we consider to be the country of Germany. And then what about the nation of Germany itself? Well, you got the Holy Roman empire of the German nation that was so named in uh, 1512, but predecessors go back to the 800s. So that was 
roughly the German area. And then there's Prussia, which went back to the 1600s and kept changing over time. So there's many different versions of Prussia. And Prussia formed the uh, North German Confederation in 1815, which covered then most of uh, Northern Germany and what's now Poland. So the first time that Germany was actually a unified country was in January 1st, 1871, when the German Empire formed. So when, when the records show that somebody was from Germany, well, it could be any one of these things. So you got to do some detective work to figure out. So let's look at Prussia for a minute here. It started out up here in the uh, top right of the map, the dark green. That was uh, Duchy of Prussia. And that joined uh, with Brandenburg to form the Kingdom of Prussia. And then over the centuries, Prussia expanded the uh, orange areas and the uh, lighter colored areas here. So Prussia kept expanding. And when it uh, turned into the German Empire in 1871, you see the Prussia actually covered most of Northern Germany and much of uh, what's now Northern Poland and even into Lithuania. So you need to be familiar with these countries and uh, when they were what. So that's, uh, maps are very helpful. And then of course, the, the Holy Roman Empire here was its largest extent. But of course, it was never really what we would call a country. It was just kind of a conglomerations of uh, different states and, and counties and stuff. And then we got to consider Napoleon. There was the area he ruled at one time. So especially in the areas of Western Germany, Alsace-Lorraine areas, there was a lot of your ancestors might have been German, but they might have been in uh, in French areas during that time period. So Germany is a country formed January 1st, 1871. These were the different states that existed prior to that. And at the end of the, well, it's actually during the Franco-Prussian War, the uh, German empire was founded. Okay, so the big key is knowing the geographic history of Germany. So you need to not only know what the countries were, what their boundaries were, but you need to know what the boundaries were at the time that your ancestor lived. So another thing you need to know is the timeline of German history. Here are some things that are important. The Protestant Revolution, Re Revolution, Reformation, the Council of Trent, that's important for genealogy because that was when the Catholic Church started requiring the sacramental registers to be maintained. And then Lutheran Church started doing that also. So that's when you get your church records mandated. Treaty of Westphalia, which ended the Thirty Years' War, that's when the religion was uh, defined by each state individually. So we had state religion starting in 1648. Uh, Napoleonic Wars, that comes into play in genealogy because Napoleon instituted civil record keeping in the areas that he controlled. So Alsace-Lorraine and, and Western Germany, that might be the first opportunity to find civil records. The democratic revolutions of 1848, that did not really affect genealogy records, but it did cause a lot of immigration to uh, the United States. A lot of people in the uh, Iowa, St. Louis area came to the United States 
after fleeing the uh, 1848. So a lot of 1848ers in that area. Uh, German Empire. As far as records go, they mandated uh, civil registration in 1876. So after 1876, the whole of German Empire probably had civil records. Prior to that time, it depended on the area that your ancestors might have been from. Uh, War of 1866, I think of Austria, Prussian War. Uh, that moved a lot of territories from Austria to Prussia. So people that lived in the Austrian Empire, probably before 1866, they became part of the German Empire that, at that time. Uh, and of course, Alsace-Lorraine, it was originally part of France. Then after the Franco-Prussian War, it became part of Germany. And then after 1918, it went back to France. So all these things about history and geography, you need to keep in mind. And it's nice to have a timeline so you can correlate it with your ancestors time period. Okay. So jurisdictions. Jurisdictions is a big takeaway from this talk because uh, jurisdictions are, have a hierarchy, different levels. So for instance, in the in United States, we have our country, our federal government, they have records, our states have records, our states have different congressional, they don't keep records, their analogy. And then the county, and of course, we know our counties are our, go to place for our vital records. So likewise in Germany, they have the counterparts. They have the top level might be the kingdom or the country or the empire. And then under that, they have the province, which corresponds to our states. And then under that, I'm not gonna try and pronounce that German name here, but it corresponds to a district. They have districts and then at the bottom level, we have the Christ. So that's another, if you don't know Christ already, that's, I hope that's one thing that you remember that Christ corresponds to the county and that's your local place you wanna to go to try and find your records. So we're gonna talk about Christ quite a bit here. And then there's other types of jurisdictions. You got the ecclesiastical. Again, you got a hierarchy of levels. Oh, excuse me. And then you got other kinds of districts, military and judicial. And keep in mind that they exist, but I haven't uh, used them or keep them or used them too much. Uh, so here's here's the important ones. Christ, abbreviation KR, corresponds to the county. And there are other names for that. And then the district level, the abbreviation is RB. And for this talk, I'm gonna just be calling district. And then there's these other, other jurisdictions too that might come into play if you're doing some more advanced searching. Okay, so why do we care about jurisdictions? Well, the records, who creates the records? Well, the people that are running the country or the area, they're the ones that create the records. So you need to know what the jurisdiction is if you want to know who created the records. You want those primary records. Uh, if you know the levels of jurisdiction for a village, that tells us what kind of records we might find available. I mean, you might find the local records for the parish, or you might need to go to the Christ, or maybe even some district records. So you need to know those jurisdictions to know where to look for records. Uh, and then very important to know, jurisdictions change with time. I think we all know that, the boundaries kept changing. So if you understand what the changes were in the jurisdictions, that can help you find out where the records are archived. You know, a jurisdiction from 1850 
need to know what jurisdiction that might be under now, who might have those records currently. So some strategies. So you want to know what the what the name of your ancestral village is or your place is now. So first thing to do is understand the jurisdictions listed in Myers, and we're going to look at that. And then you can also use Wikipedia articles, and you want to use the German version of Wikipedia. That, of course, be in German, but you can get it translated. So that's the best place to find out about current German place names. And then there's this guy, which I will just call GOV. I won't try and pronounce it. Uh, and we'll talk about that too. So you use these things, and then you can use a modern atlas to find out what the present day locations are. And then Myers will also tell you uh, adjacent locations, and that will help you uh, figure out if the uh, location in Myers does not exist today, you might be able to use adjacent locations to figure out the place today. And then of course you can use the uh, geographic coordinates to find town locations. And what should you be asking yourself as you do your research? You do maps and gazetteers. Well, keep a timeline of how the boundaries have changed. And then note the hierarchy, the local, medium, or high level districts. Who kept the records in your ancestors' day? What level of archives are available? And where can we find the archives today? So, summary, part one. The name and date is not sufficient. You got to know the precise location. And without knowing the location, it's pretty hard to find the records. And then also the location can use, be used to distinguish individuals with the same name. And you want to find the locations by working backward in time. Start with, you know, link your prior generations. And then remember the records are created at the time and place of the event. If at all possible, you want your primary sources. So know the jurisdictions, parish before civil records. All you had was the uh, church records before 1876, or in some places, some civil records were earlier. And then know your hierarchy, Christ, your county, that's your first go-to place, and you got your state and your country records. And then the present day map, that will tell you the current name and where the archives might be located. So Katie, do we have any uh, questions pertaining to this section so far? Uh, we do have a question about um, searching with a common last name. I'm not sure if you're gonna address anything um, in your other sections or if we wanna save that for the end. Yeah, <laughs> well, I probably don't have any specific recommendations. It's just the point is that if you can tie that last name to a specific location, it's going to be a big help. Yeah, they do have a specific name, um, Wagner, and a specific location, Castle, Germany. So I'm not sure if that's a super common um, surname in that area or not. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't have any information in this talk about uh, tying specific names to specific locations. Well, maybe that's a talk for a future day. <laughs> yeah, we, we can uh, we can talk about finding the name of that town hall. Maybe afterwards we can, uh, can try it. Okay, so here's the heart of the talk. The three big tools. These are the ones that you're really going to be a big help in uh, finding German ancestral villages. And Myers Ort, first one, Gazetteer, and I, again, the, the link is in your handouts. The second one, if your ancestors are from Eastern Germany, Kartenmeister, Pomerania, and then GOV, 
So those are three I would talk about. And then there's some other things that uh, are helpful to use along with those. So to repeat, you want to find a potential name for your village. You can use census records, vital records, family lore, obituaries, Germans to America, and other things. And again, that you need to use your ingenuity and what you can find out. So here, I'll give you a couple examples from uh, a census record. And I'm sure you've all used that. Uh, this is from my wife's great grandparents, 1930. We got Gustav and Emma. I'm going to use them as an example here through the talk. Um, what do we know from the census? Well, I'm sure you've seen this before. We know their immigration date estimate, approximate. We know their birthplace. And, and for this decade, we knew their parents' birthplaces. But it's only the country. So it gives us a general idea, but it's not really helpful finding a specific village. However, I struck gold in this case. Milwaukee County marriages had their marriage record. So for Gustav, I know I got his full name. I got his parents' names. And I also got the hometown in Pomerania. And I said, wow, that's wonderful. I know where they were from. Well, again, maybe. What have I been saying all along? That's a potential hometown. So, you know, we need to check it out. I and mean, we're going to be talking about that. So for Emma, again, we got the same, same thing. I learned her full name, her parents' names, and I learned her hometown. And again, her potential hometown. We'll see what we can do about that. Another place you might want to find your ancestor's hometown is Germans to America. And as you might know, that's a list of uh, basically a passenger list of ships coming from uh, Germany. So here's one from 1861. And I happened to find my great great grandfather and his wife and youngest son. And it told me when they arrived in New York. So there's the entry here, I'm going on to the next page. And the thing I learned from German was it gives you the province and the village for some people. Unfortunately, not very many. But the entry for my family, it shows the province as GR, it shows the village as WQ8. Well, what does that tell me? Well, if you look at the beginning of that particular volume, if you've got the hard copy, there's a codes are listed there. So GR is just Germany. Well, that doesn't tell a lot. 1861, Germany didn't really exist then. But it gave me the name of the village, Venthagen. And with some research, I found out that's in the little uh, principality of Schomburg Lippe. So I learned their, their home village from that. So what do you do when you find a potential home village? Well, a gazetteer is where you want to go. So Myers Ort is the, the most common one and the best one to start with. A gazetteer is dictionary place names. It usually has an atlas with it and a list of other specific data. And there's themes. It might be geography, topography, or in case of Myers, it's a, a business thing. It was written for business people to find out about potential customers. And for genealogy, we want a gazetteer that tells us about the jurisdictions. We want to know who ruled that area and what kind of records did they keep and where we might want to find those records today. So Myers Gazetteer, usually called just Myers. Here's the full name of it. It was published in 1912. So it tells you every place name 
in the German Empire that existed in 1912. It was republished in 2000, uh, in the hard copy version. Uh, the copy we have in the Janesville Library, it's two volumes, they're each about two inches thick. But uh, they were act the hard copy was actually made obsolete in 2017 when the it was, digital version was published online. So that's what you want to use. Okay, so why do we want to use it? Well, one of the sets of information that the Myers includes is the 1912 jurisdictions. They list all the jurisdictions, the hierarchy, for each place name. It gives the church locations. So I don't think the hard copy does, but the, uh, the online will show you all the nearby churches. Uh, and you can associate the 1912 map with modern maps. So you can find out where the present day location is for that uh, ancestral village from 1912. And once you get information from Myers, you can use that to help you dig out information from other gazetteers. And then that, that kind of correlates with the uh, family history catalog too. So it's helpful. So what are the problems with Myers? Well, the hard copy is written in German with fractur font, and it's impossible, almost impossible for an amateur like us to uh, decipher. And the hard copy, again, you use abbreviations and there's a punctuation conventions. So hard copy is not too useful, except for experts. Um, it doesn't include the parish. It shows where the churches are located, but if the town does not have a, a church in it, it, it doesn't really tell you what parish your relatives, uh, ancestors might have attended. And key thing here, I keep bringing up 1912. You need to remember that. It's the names that were in effect in that year. If there were old or previous names, they're not going to show up. So, so we'll have to talk about that. If your ancestral village name doesn't show up in Myers, what are you going to do? So here's what we can do. So there's the uh, link. Uh, I got my great grandma's funeral book. It gives her birthplace and also her husband's birthplace. And her husband's birthplace was listed as Wollenick. So just like for uh, Gustav and Emma, I said, aha, I know where great grandma was from. Well, so I typed in Wollenick in Myers. You got to search, you type in your, your village or place name and bingo, you, whoops, wait a minute, what happened? Oh, it says there were no results. What do you want to do? It says, well, try some wild cards. So wild cards for Myers, like uh, other things, a question mark is a single character wild card. An asterisk is a multiple char character wild card. And there's also sounds like or previous entry options, which we won't get into today. So I tried a wild card. I put in W-O asterisk Nick. I knew the beginning and the ending. And what did it tell me? It's, oh, it found three matches. And look at this one here. The spelling is almost exact. An L and a T. Well, that's an easy confusion to make. So I figured I'm pretty confident that that is the right place. It also turns out it's in the right part of Germany. It's near where great grandma was from also. So I'm pretty confident I found the right town. Now I know the actual spelling from 1912. It's becoming less of a potential name. So what do we learn? Wild cards are very useful. So the spelling might get changed or garbled, or it might've been changed in during in, back in Germany during history too. So wild cards are an important key. 
So I learned that Wallenick in America really is the town of Wodenick, which still exists in Germany today. And then for Gustav and Emma, well, I got gross rates from marriage record, but the actual town in Germany was this spelling. And then Klein Schwerin was actually the town of Klein Schwerzen in 1912. So now I've got the 1912 spellings, the villages, which I'm pretty confident are the right villages. So let's actually look at what you get out of Myers. So here's Wodenick. I got the correct spelling, and this is what we see. And up here in the top left, if you've got the hard copy, that's all that you see. So how many of you think you can make something sense out of that? Probably not, right? But this is why we need the digital version. The digital version gives us a map, and it also gives us the hierarchy. It gives you the location, it gives you the highest level, the province, the district, and here's the Christ. And if we want details about this hierarchy of jurisdictions, we can click on detail. And lo and behold, it tells you, oh, it says Wodenick is a dwarf, a village or a state. Here's the kingdom. It was in Prussia. It was in the province of Pomerania, Pomeran. And here's the district of Strasland. And the, oh, here's Christ. The Christ is Grimmen. So I know the hierarchy of, of my village in 1912. Somehow the digital version, uh, online version, extracts all that from that code. So here's, here's the uh, names and the abbreviations that you need to, need to remember. PR is for Prussia. RB is, is the district level. And KR is Christ. So those are the three that you're probably going to be using all the time. So make sure you know those. And here's the other ones for more advanced stuff. So let's get to the map. That's the fun part. The really neat thing about Myers is that it gives you, it has stitched together a 1912 map. So it's showing me Wodenick in 1912 map. So well, that's pretty neat, but here's the magic. You go up here to toggle, toggle the thing, you can change your 1912 map into a 2021 map. So here's much easier to see here, less clutter. Here's where Wodenick is in the present day map. And if you're thinking about going to visit or want to see what the village is like today, you can toggle again and you can get a satellite image of what your ancestral village is. Pretty neat, huh? Okay, so let's let's go back to uh, Gustav and Emma. I found their villages. I found villages with their names, and I wanted to find out well, are those really the right villages? So I popped them up on Myers, and I showed them here. And here's something in Myers, I haven't been able to figure out how to get a, uh, a scale. I can't tell on Myers how far apart these are. Maybe if somebody knows that, they can, uh, can help me out. But what I can do is go to Google Earth and I can put those villages in, the present day villages. I had to use the Polish names. I'll show you how to get that later. And I can draw a path, and the path will tell me that they are 7.3 miles apart. So I'm guessing that when uh, Gustav's first wife died, his family back in, in Germany sent him a, a bride from uh, 
7.3 miles away to Milwaukee to get married. So I'm pretty sure I've got the, my potential villages are the correct villages. So here's another neat thing about Myers. It's got ecclesiastical data. So if I choose that tab up here, it will tell me the churches that are nearby, their distance from the village, and whether they are Catholic or Protestant. And you can see that was a Northern German, it was a Protestant area. So, so that is helpful in telling me, it says, well, it suggests that the parish is actually Pritzig, but I have to kind of use other things to figure out which church my family actually went to, because here's, here's the town and here's the three nearest churches. So, you know, it's not necessarily guaranteed that they did actually go to this church. They might have gone to one of the other churches. So that requires some detective work. But the nice thing is Meyer shows you where the churches are that they might have went to. If you use a modern map, I zoomed out here. Here's that previous one. You can see easier to see where the churches were on the present day map. Okay. Here's something else you need to know about Myers. The place names are not always unique. You know, you might think if you type in Berlin, you're going to get the capital of Germany, but there are actually other Berlins in, in 1912 Germany. So in Pat's case, she had a uh, family member from Dahlem. So I typed in in Myers, I typed in Dahlem, and what do I get? I had five hits on that village. So what do we do? Well, you got to look at them, each one, and see what you can figure out. So here's the three that were in the correct part of Germany. And so I had to go through each of those three and find out the records from the family. And then I found out a, uh, a parish church mentioned in, in one record and that told me which of these three was the correct one. So again, it's something that you got to use your ingenuity to figure out using nearby place names in the records that you can look up. Okay, so that's Myers. Second big tool is Kartenmeister. So Kartenmeister pertains to eastern parts of the German Empire. So here's present-day Germany, present-day Poland, and here is an overlay of the German Empire. So Kartenmeister is the eastern part here. Maybe some Germany, mostly in Poland. Okay, so if your ancestors from Pomerania, or Prussia, maybe Silesia, Kartmeister might be helpful for you. So it's in German, but there's an option to pick English. So you can read the uh, instructions in English. And again, the instruction tell you it's an East. But why do we need Kartmeister? Doesn't Myers tell us everything we need to know? Well, here's the thing. If there's an older German name that existed prior to 1912, that won't be in Myers. And Kartmeister points out there were this many name changes and this many were changed twice or more. So there's a lot of older place names that won't show up in Myers. So that's why you wanna to go to Kartmeister. And kind of corresponding to that, Kartenmeister gives you the present day Polish or Russian or Lithuanian name. That's how I found the uh, Polish village names for uh, Gustav and Emma. And then the records will tell you if there was an old place name, it will tell you when that name existed. So, so I went to the uh, Gustav's gross breeds, Type that in here under the German city. 
And what did I get? I got the present day Polish name. I got the uh, geographic coordinates. I got the parish. And then I got the population in uh, 1905 for that little village. So I knew where Gustav was from. And then the same thing for Emma. Type in her village name, which I got from Myers. So I had the correct spelling. And they told me that same information about Emma. And her village was also small. Okay, third big tool, we got to get quickly here, is GOV. I won't try and pronounce the full name. I just call it GOV. That's a big genealogy site. Some of you might have used it already for other things, but there is a, a map section. So you can go to the Gazetteer and I can type in my Wodenek and get information from GOV about that village. So why do we need GOV? Well, Wodenek is not a good example. So I took uh, Teresa McMillan's example. She used this town here which is in Western Germany. It's a little more interesting history. And in GOV, it will list all the jurisdictions over time. So it was a cloister before 1803. There was these things, principality. It was an archdiocese. It was in the French Republic for a while. It was an imperial county. It was in the Holy Empire during this time period. So it gives you a list. So if you got an ancestor from a certain time, you can go to this list for your village and find out what the jurisdictions were at that time. And I'm a visual map person. So here's what I really love about GOV. It will graph the jurisdictions in their history. Well, here's this uh, Macmillan example. That's too complicated. So let's go back to my Wotanik example. Here is the history of the jurisdictions for Wotanik. You can see what's going on. I'll zoom in here on this box. So you see it gives the jurisdiction. It gives you the time period that it belonged to this one, the time period. And Wotanik was in East Germany for a while. So it was in this district, which was part of DDR. For that time period. So that's a neat thing. That's why you want to use GOV if you want to find out the history of the jurisdictions. So, summary Meyer's Ort, it covers the whole German Empire for one time period, 1912. It gives a hierarchy of the jurisdictions. It's got the map, really helpful, and it gives you the church locations. Kartmeister, while it only covers Eastern Germany, it gives all the name changes and the Polish name, and it shows a church parish, and it links to Google Maps. GOV, the reason you want to use that is it gives you the jurisdictional history. Okay. So, Katie, do you have any questions about this section? Sure, there are a couple of questions that came in. Um, that might be a little uh, from last section too. Um, so someone asked, what percentage of Germans who came to America did not get recorded in Germans to America, especially if they traveled between 1845 and 1855? Oh, well, Germans to America has 6 million entries. So there's a lot. Uh, that time period you mentioned, uh, I think they were recording, let's see, let's see if I get this straight here, ships that had a certain percentage of Germans on, they were recording all the people on those ships for that, like a 10 year time period. For most of 1845 through 1890, whatever it was, they just recorded the people that listed themselves as having been from Germany. So whether they got into Germans to America depended on how they were listed on the manifest. So my great grandfather Wasserstrass did not come in, uh, get in Germans to America. 
Uh, he came to Antwerp, and for some reason, his ship didn't show up. I guess there weren't enough Germans on it, bigger percentage. So as far as what percentage got into the Germans to America or not, I can't tell you. But if you uh, take 6 million Germans over how many Germans immigrated from 1840 to 1892, that might give you a percentage. Okay, what else did you have? Um, someone else is also asking about Germans to America and wondering if there's a legend that translates the WQA. Yeah. Uh, if you got the online version, I'm not sure. I haven't figured that out yet. But the hard copy, each volume has a chart in the front that's got the codes. Uh, you know, it shows the profession. It's got a code for the professions. It's got the code for the villages. Uh, it's got the code for the uh, for the province. So it's got all those codes at the beginning, the hard copy. Uh, the hard copies, we've got one in Janesville. Uh, Whitewater has one. I'm sure there's several in Milwaukee area and in, in Madison. I'm not sure if Appleton and you got a hard copy up in your area. We do not at the library. Um, the Brown County one in Green Bay might have one. Um, I'm not sure where else the, the most closest one would be, but I know this Wisconsin Historical Society does have it in Madison. Yeah, if somebody knows how to find those codes in the uh, online version, I'd really like to know. <laughs> That'd be a big help. It's a pain to have to go to the library and find the right volume. Okay, anything else? All the other questions were more um, general that were saved to the end. Okay, yeah, well, <laughs> got real quick here. There's a whole bunch of other things that might be useful. And I'll just go through those real quick, just so you get the name of the uh, resource in your brain and maybe a little bit of image of what, what you can find in it. So Hansen's Map Guide to Parish Registers. It's soft cover, has 57 volumes. Each of them is a little bigger than the magazine. And it's not yet complete. They're still adding versions. It started in 2004. It's in English. Uh, it's divided. Each volume has a certain German state, province, or free cities. So um, did I leave out? It's it's not online. <laughs> uh, so you got to go go to find find a set and browse through and find a particular state, province, or free city that you want to, and then and go to that particular volume. And it's got a maps for each parish. So you can find uh, what parish your village is in. And then each volume has an index, kind of like Germans to America. It's got a list of all the places that are in that particular volume. So the weakness is that it's valid for only one period of time, mostly early 1900s. Uh, and it's not complete for the whole German empire yet. I think it's getting close. Uh, and it does not have secular jurisdictions. As the title suggests, it's, it's parishes, Catholic and Lutheran. And it doesn't have a social context. And this is the big disadvantage. It's not available online. Uh, you know, the German interest group has donated the set to the Janesville Library. I don't know where else it might be. So it's in the Janesville Library. Uh, just a quick example. Here is a particular one. My... Uh, Ancestors Venthagen was in Schaumburg Lippa. So I found this one, Schaumburg Lippa. And then there's the in table of contents, and it tells me what page to go to. And then the Schaumburg Lippa is a small, small uh, principality. There's only two counties in it. And then I could go to there and find out Venthagen. And here's why you might want to use this. I found my village, Svenhagen, and it's got a three by there. And then if I go up here to the top, I say, oh, three is the Solbeck Parish. And the Solbeck Parish, fortunately for me, the birth records are online. So I could trace my uh, answers back to the uh, 1600s in, uh, online in Solbeck. 
So if you're looking for the parish and you can't find any other things, uh, Hansen's guide might tell you. Here's, here's what the maps look like in Hansen's, Lutheran Catholic. Another resource that's also in uh, soft cover, hard copy is Roger Minert's place names. He's got alphabetical listing of place names. If you just want, want to find the place name, but what is neat about his is he's got a reverse listing. So if you know the ending, if you can't decipher the beginning of your place name, you can do the end. So for example, over here is all the all the Hoggins. If you know your village name ended with Hagen, you can, you can search through it there. So another one is Prussian Gazetteers. Here's the actual formal name. It's for the year 1905. Unfortunately, the records are in German and they use Fractor. It's kind of like the hard copy of Myers. Not very useful unless somebody really does a study. It's got 13 volumes and an index. Uh, and then it's got, the, you can you go to the index and you can find out which volume they're in. Uh, it can be found online. And it's in Ancestry. If you want to find it in Ancestry, you go to Gazetteers, and it's right here, right above Myers. But, like I said, it's in German, script. It's hard to read. Just an example of what you might look up. It's kind of like here, the headings are kind of like if you look up German uh, church records, headings are kind of similar. You can look through the headings and if you figure out the certain German keywords, you can, might be able to figure them out. But not something that's easy to use. Then you got the Society for our German Genealogy in Eastern Europe. They have a website, which I haven't really used, but you can also do searches on place names. For instance, uh, Gustav and Emma, they were in the Christ of Rummelsburg. So I, I tried to uh, find out the village names in Rummelsburg, and it, it gave me that stuff. Another resource is Jewish Gen. Jewish Gen is not list, limited to the German Empire. It's the, all of Eastern Germany. So you can find the place names on there if some of your German uh, ancestors were uh, in other areas outside of the German Empire. So that'd be a reason for, for going here. So here's just an example of something I found here for gross reits. And Jewish Gen does have a, have a maps. And notice here, gross reits, there's a third spelling. So, okay, so some other resources in the last couple of minutes, uh, map sources. This one's really fun. Old Maps Online. Here's the link. It's in the handout. You can find a place. You can browse, but you can find a place. And here's the here's neat thing about it. You can set a time period. So Wasserstrauss family is from Berlin. So I wanted to find maps for Berlin in this time period, 1870 to 1895. So I can use the slider, choose my time period, and then go to the map and I can make a box and it will find maps that cover that area in that time period. It's a real handy way to find an old map. So for in this case here, it gave me a list of maps that uh, fit those criteria. And here's just an example of two that I found, one from Berlin, 1803, Berlin, 1835. Oh, I just love maps. So wonderful, nice nice way to find maps. Another one with maps is David Rumsey. A lot of maps. Uh, you gotta kind of browse and, and hunt. Not quite so easy to find maps as old maps online. But it's a nice resource. He has lots of maps. Another place to look for maps is a Newberry Library. In cartography, they got special map collections. So you can go to the Newberry 
cartography.org and you go to their cartography and you search for special maps and you can look and see what kind of maps they have. And then they got this atlas here. This is more for US county stuff. And you can do that with this Google. All right, I got county maps, archive portal. Here's the link. Notice it's uh, the German, there's no E on there in the link. That's a guide to German archives. So once you found your German ancestral village and you want to find out where there might be an archive today, this is where you want to go. And I'm sorry, I haven't played with it much. I can, probably can't help you, but that's the place you want, you want to check out. And again, here's what you want to, the uh, search page, find something. So it gave me these results for Rummelberg and tell me what kind of archives might be available for Rummelberg. Rummelsberg, the, uh, the price. Okay, I mentioned this. You can find current information, wikipedia.de, use the German, Wikipedia. Here's what it gave me for Wodemick. And then most of the uh, states in Germany have more of a, a tourist kind of thing that will give you information about that particular district or state in Germany today. This happens to be the one for Baden-Württemberg. Okay, USGS, mostly US stuff. It's got a national map. And then it's got a list of uh, USGS names. You can find geographic name, names on here. And I think that's not just limited to the US, but it might be helpful if you wanna find where your ancestors came to in the US. So here's a list of all the other stuff that I quickly went over. So do you have any questions about those resources or in general? Yeah, I've got quite a few questions. Um, so let's see, the next one is, my ancestors lived in Germany many generations back. So why does my DNA show no German? Well, that's hitting kind of, kind of close to home. <laughs> when, when I did my ancestry DNA, I was, you know, I figured I was 100% German, but uh, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I was 40 some percent German and almost that much Scandinavian. So I think since my uh, ancestors came from north of Berlin, you know, part of that Pomerania was, was Swedish Pomerania for a while. So I guess I got a lot of a lot of Scandinavian genes mixed in with my ancestors that came from that part of Germany. Uh, the other reason that is more general is that Germany has pretty strict privacy laws. And so their DNA databases are pretty sparse compared to US databases. So, so matching your DNA to present day German DNA is probably not as good as it is for a lot of other areas in the world, especially in the US. You know, US, they got a lot of data where people live and where they were from. But uh, so yeah, I think it's less likely that, <laughs> that's probably the main reason is probably that uh, the German, German DNA database is, is not real good yet. All right, our next question. Um, this, per this person has never been able to get a location beyond Pomerania. So what suggestions do you have for finding that, you know, village or town name? Oh, dear. <laughs> like I said, that's a lot of detective work. It's, uh, and I think I was extremely lucky to, to find all mine. I found them all real quick. Uh, so I don't have a lot of experience uh, searching that uh, I can help you. Uh, you know, I've got to 
find try and find obituaries that might uh, list the hometowns or uh, go to maybe uh, maybe relatives. You know, not necessarily your direct ancestors, maybe cousins. Now that we got uh, DNA resources based, you could find some cousins or second cousins uh, there. They they might have information that you're not familiar with. Yeah, I would definitely make sure you're you're researching all the record possibilities in the United States because there there has to be a record somewhere um, that at least zero you in a little bit closer and, and definitely looking at all those lines, not just your direct ancestor, but the collateral lines because you know maybe your ancestor didn't have the, the village name, but maybe their second cousin did on their record. So. Yeah, especially especially in Wisconsin, I know a lot of the towns in Wisconsin where the Germans settled. The people that settled in that particular village, they tended to come from the same part of Germany. Mm -hmm. So if you know know somebody else that has German ancestry from the same part of part of same town in the United States, they their ancestors might have come from the same town as yours. All right. Um, so regarding recording place names, you said to use the historic name, um, but this person said they've heard the opposite. So why should you use the historic name? Well, I guess that's a personal opinion. Uh, if, if they came from a, a certain town in a certain time period, I think that's, that's what I would want to have in my records, that what the name of the town was when they left. But of course, for your archives, of course, you need to know the, the modern name. Yeah, so you really need to know both. So I guess it's kind of more of a matter of preference, but definitely, like like you said, I would want to have that original name where my ancestors, when what it was when they lived there. Yeah. Um, so what sources would you use to find the village of an 18th century ancestor? Um, they came to America in 1749. Oh, wow. That was way before Germans to America. Germans to America started in 1845. So... Before that, you had basically just passenger list. And those were, I don't think there was any standard back in those days. You know, just find a passenger list and hope that they, they had some information for you. Yeah, and of course, uh, you know, people talk about Ellis Island all the time. Well, Ellis Island didn't start till 1892, was it? Before that, you had Castle Garden, and that was 1855 or so. You know, so before 1855, there was no, even in New York, there was no standard entry point. So back in the uh, 1700s, you're, it's just the luck of the draw with your passenger list, I think. Yeah, we had another similar question saying their ancestors came before the American Revolution and, you know, there's no census records. So what sources are there? I would say definitely look where your ancestors settled in the United States and get really familiar with what records that that area had. Yeah, that's a good point, because where people settled, depending on the time, the period that they came. You know, people that came in Germany were in the late 19th century, or in Wisconsin, we're from the late 19th century, but people earlier settled in New York area and New England, Cincinnati, maybe. All right, our next question. Um, this person has information that their ancestor traveled by steamship back to the old country in December 1894, leaving from Philadelphia. Um, but when they search for deport departures, all they get is arrivals um, for the passenger list. So is there any type of trick to finding the departure list? The question was departing from the U.S. to go back? Yeah. Well, 1894, huh? The uh, Germans to America does include some of those things. I've seen entries where it listed like St. Louis as the as a departure point. <laughs> so Ger Germans to America might show it. But yeah, I don't I don't know what else. I haven't seen any uh passenger list for departures. Well, it sounds like this one they're they're going back to the old country, so they're going from the United States to Germany from yeah. Philadelphia. So I would look and see 
you know, what passenger lists are available from Philadelphia in that time period. Um, they might not be online yet. Um, not everything is online, of course. So yeah. look at what um, records like the Philadelphia Library might have or what archives they have in the Philadelphia area. Uh, our next one, any, any ideas to search for German ancestors coming as part of the Palatine immigration? Oh, okay, so Palatines, that was, that was earlier, earlier time periods. So your New England, New York, East Coast, you know, that's probably where they would have settled. You know, when you get to 1848 with the 48ers, later from the Palatines, they, they came to uh, St. Louis, Iowa area, Davenport. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. You're, they're, they're getting more into your area of expertise, I think, Katie. Someone else um, also typed into chat, try searching for passport applications um, for departures from the United States, because obviously, um, maybe at that time period, they had to have a, a passport to get back, so. Yeah, yeah, again, that's, that's, that's not really the topic of this talk, but yeah, people have talked about that. People uh, needed to get... Uh, I don't know what, what you call them, like exit visas. I forget what the official name is. You know, in order to leave during most time periods, the people had to get permission to leave and they had to fill out documents. So there are documents in Europe that uh, show their permission. They had to publish in, in the newspapers. So there is there are records of when people were leaving and, and that, you know, that they got permission. And there's another question about um, German lines coming before um, 1775. So again, just you know, looking and seeing where your ancestors settled, what records, and being familiar, like learn as much as you can about where they settled and what records there were. You know, there's not always passenger lists, um, but there might be church records in that area. Um, there's not census records, um, you know, super early before 1790. So what other records are there? Um, so I definitely suggest you know, learning as much as possible about where they settled and seeing what you can find that might lead you back to Germany. Yeah, look at the, his look at the history of the village in America and, and see what uh, you can find about the history of that village and where the people in that village came from. Uh, this person, they said they have a German ancestor who came in 1850 to Washington County, Wisconsin. How would they have traveled to Wisconsin after getting to America in 1850? Oh, yeah, I've heard a couple talks on that topic, uh, several different ways. You know, some people actually came through Canada. One of my wife's ancestors did, came through Canada and went that route, uh, came by Erie Canal and through the Great Lakes by, by boat. Uh, what, was it, what was the date? 1850. Yeah, that was probably before trains. You know, some people came overland, several different routes they could have come overland, partly by water, partly by land. Yeah, I would guess that they, they might have traveled through the Great Lakes. I mean, those were all kind of interconnected and or maybe did a little land travel. Um, yeah, there's kind of no way of knowing for sure where your how your ancestors got here unless they documented it some way, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't know how any of my people got from the East Coast to Chicago, but... Uh, yeah, Great Lakes in that time period, Great Lakes was probably the most likely. Um, someone said their grandfather left Bremen in 1890 at the age of 14, and they were told that he was a stowaway on a ship. He arrived in Baltimore. Um, what would be their best source to find who his parents were in Bernack, Germany? A stowaway. Oh. Well, <laughs> I guess he's definitely not going to show up in uh, Germans to America then. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, hopefully when I go to Germany next year, I'll get to see Bremen and see what kind of archives they got there. There are records in, in Bremen, I know, that uh, might show departures. So I don't know. <laughs> Again, if he was a stowaway, I don't know if he would have got into the records. Yeah, um, you know, there might be church records, obviously, if, um, he was 14 in 1890, so church records from, you know, the 1870s or whatever, that's not unheard of. So um, definitely look and see if, I mean, it might be 
a lot of searching to, to see, you know, what church records are there. Um, you might get lucky and find like a baptism record or something um, that would list his, his parents. Uh, someone also said in chat, assume the relative wasn't a stowaway and research it as normal. So, um, you know, maybe it's just a myth in your family, a, a legend that was, was passed down and it's not true. And someone also said um, their, their family was thought to be a stowaway too, but they were just listed under his mother's new husband's last name. So lots of different possibilities. Um, going back to our Palantine's question, um, also someone put into chat that there's a genealogy association um, Palantines to America um, and Mid-Atlantic Germanic Society. Um, so those are some, some good questions um, yeah. to get out of the chat as well. Yeah, that'd be, a good, that'd be a good resource. Yeah, they do a lot of stuff. I've seen a lot of conferences that they put out. Um, someone also said um, a suggestion is to look for names in U.S. newspapers because you might be able to find articles that list um, where they were from in Germany. Yeah, you, I've found in obituaries before or, um, you know, other records of my ancestor, you know, they listed where they were from in Germany or at least, you know, kind of the county that kind of at least narrows it down for you. Yeah, Wisconsin Historical Society has a wonderful newspaper collection and uh, that might be a source to find names in newspapers. And I've heard that the uh, library in Fort Wayne, was it Clark County? They have a good newspaper collection also, I think. Um, someone says they have an ancestor with her birth name on a census being 1831 in Germany, but then she can't find anything on her until the birth of her first child in 1854 in California. Um, she hasn't been able to find anything on her immigration. So do you have any suggestions for that? Oh, short answer is no. Yeah, I can't think of anything either. I mean, because you think obviously it'd be in the 1850s or, or earlier that they would have come and those, you know, you're not guaranteed to get a passenger list, unfortunately, in that time. Or if there was a passenger list, sometimes they've been damaged or burned or they might not be available online. Um, again, I would try to search where they were living in, in California and, and be really familiar with what records are available, where they lived, or, um, you know, see if, you know, there's some newspaper mention of that they lived somewhere else before they came to California. Um, you never know. You're just, you have to be diligent and, and be a detective and continue searching and searching and searching, but realize, you know, you might not always be able to find that information, unfortunately. And it depends on the time period and, and things like that. Um, I want to follow up too on the question we had earlier about researching with a common um, last name. Um, so obviously, I'm sure a lot of people have like Johnson in their in their family tree or Smith. Um, this person was specifically searching for Wagner in Castle, Germany. Um, obviously, just go through all the Wagners that are in that area and and kind of write down what you know about each person and go with the context clues. You kind of have to research every person that has your same ancestor's name or last name and kind of, you know, determine the family lines, kind of build that family tree for each of those Wagner lines that you find in that area and, and see what happens and, and see how they connect with you. Maybe you won't, won't find the answer right away of how they're connected to you, but maybe further on in your research in a few years, you'll find out, oh, so-and-so was a second cousin of so-and-so. Um, so definitely, you know, make sure you're documenting your research really well and, and trying to use context clues to, to untangle those trees. Um, another question we have, um, my grandfather was born in 1875 in Bayern, uh, Bavaria, Bernack, Germany. Do I have this correctly shown as state, country, and village? Let's see, say, say that again. Bayern, Bavaria, Bernack, Germany. What was the third one? Bavaria. Oh, Bavaria. Yeah, I, I, I think that would be the best way to search for it, yeah. You want to start with a city first and a country last. 
yeah, Bavaria was uh, was a until until the formation of the German Empire, that was a separate uh, country. Um, someone says um, in the U.S. Census, um, their ancestor's name is spelled multiple different ways. So, how do you go about doing that? What do you think is the best way? I would say search all those different ways, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta. Yeah, I think I think most genealogists know that in the past people weren't very strict about their spelling. They kept changing it for different reasons. Yeah, so definitely um, think about all the other misspellings that you haven't come across yet and, and try searching it that way. Like when I found my stilt ancestors, um, their passenger list, it was indexed with like a K. Well, I would have never thought that it would have been misspelled with a K, but of course, you know, when you're read, trying to read the handwriting, sometimes the S's look like K's. So even, you know, that way, you have to think about how it mis might have been misread and how you might um, have the letters look different. Um, to some people who are indexing it. Yeah, you need to know that a lot of the records we find, if we find an index to the record, that somebody transliterated it and they could have made a mistake like that. And there's lots of really great um, suggestions in chat for people. Um, you know, like if you are stuck on your certain answers, just definitely look to siblings records, especially in the large families. Um, you never know what you'll be able to find. Um, somebody also suggested local German language newspapers um, are very common, especially in the United States. Um, so you might not be able to read German, um, but there's definitely, you know, some translation tools that you can use um, to look at those German language newspapers. And of course, you can probably pick out your, your family's name. So um, someone said, um, if they know um, where they are from, which... Um, like what town they're from, which is the best resource to use? Well, yeah, now you're, now you're getting to the heart of what I was trying to trying to say here. Yeah, start with Myers. Go to Myers, see if you can find out what the what the correct spelling is for 1912. Start with there. And that will give you the historical name for 1912. And then uh, the map will give you the location. Yeah, so start with Myers, and if it's in Eastern Germany, if it doesn't show up in Myers, then I'd go to Kartmeister, and hopefully it's in Eastern Germany and it show up there. Yeah, I think all of these these resources should be used kind of in conjunction with e with each other, depending on where um, in the country it is. But they all have their kind of pros and cons, as John kind of pointed out with several of them today. Yeah, I've I've had people contact me and say, oh yeah, I, I'm sure this is the name of my town. And it was in Western Germany, but it doesn't show up in Meyer. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. And remember too that, you know, just because you think it's in a certain part of Germany doesn't mean that there isn't another, you know, village or town with that same name. So you have to really narrow it down to, to make sure that you're researching in the right part of the country, or even if there are a couple um, town names in the same general vicinity you know, making sure that you're definitely pinpointing the right one. <laughs> Sometimes it takes and a lot again, of work. And again, that, that depends on a lot of the time period. If they came in uh, early 1700s or early 1800s, they were probably from Western Germany. So, you know, you want to be looking in the Rhineland is the probable, probable area. Whereas they came in the late 1800s and you're more likely in Pomerania, Prussia. And yeah, there's some more great yeah. suggestions about our question earlier um, about how to travel from the East Coast to Wisconsin. Somebody said in 1856, there was a train um, and someone else um, offered that um, they should check the immigration and settlement patterns of German communities in North America. There's a, a book uh, um, from FamilySearch that they put a link in there for you. So lots of yeah. great suggestions from our audience as well. Yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, by 1850, we did have a lot of railroads in the U.S., didn't we? I'm not sure. I, I, we do have um, uh, our November topic is about um, coming to America by train. So definitely check that out as well. You might get some some good tips and tricks from Bob Lettenbecker um, from the National Railroad Museum is going to chat with us about 
you know, how our ancestors traveled by train, so. Um, someone's asking about the slide presentation being available. We are recording today's session, so you are able to watch it on YouTube again. Um, or hopefully have it on there tomorrow or Monday at the latest. So or send out a link to, to everyone who registered with the video. Those are all the questions we had, it looks like, unless anybody has any last minute ones. Oh, here's another one that just came in. So after you find the name in Myers, then what do you do with that information? So like, how do you find a record from that location? Would you use family search or another database to, to find more information? Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess if you have the uh, correct name, historical name from Myers, that's probably what you want to do, go to family search and see what records they will give you and help you find the uh, right name, right person name associated with that location. I think, you know, definitely check out family search and other databases. There's lots of different ways you can find records from that location. Um, John shared a couple of like archive um, sites definitely follow up with the archives in, in Germany from where your ancestors from. Yeah, you've got the, once you've got the name, you also know the Christ, the county. So you can look, look for that Christ and find out what kind of records are, are in that Christ. And then, uh, you know, this is more advanced for what I've got so far, but then, then you want to go and uh, see what archives are existing today for that price. Someone's asking if um, New Orleans is a common point of entry. They said their ancestor was on the United States Census, but not before, and they have no entry point. Um, for Germans, I'm not sure if, if that was a common entry point or not. Uh, I've seen a lot come through Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, but that doesn't mean that they didn't uh, travel in a roundabout way to get to the United States. Uh, it's kind of tough to say. Yeah. Yeah, new, new, most people were the East Coast, you're right. But then uh, a lot of them came through uh, New Orleans, especially during the 48ers time period. But there were some, some earlier too. And someone said um, they went to Myers to look up a village in Austria. Austria is not found. Um, so do you know Myers only covers Germany, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm not well, sure of any Austrian uh, resources. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, it covers, you know, part uh, after the uh, Austria-Prussian War, part of Austria got incorporated into Germany. So those parts of the Austrian Empire would be included, but uh, Hungary and Austria, the main parts would not be included in Myers. I think, uh, I think in that case, Jewish Gen would be your only option because they cover all of Eastern Europe. And also, um, I know like there's a couple genealogy Facebook groups that I found um, specifically for German, but I'm sure there's Austrian ones or, or ones like French, Ireland, like all different countries, I'm sure have lots of Facebook groups or their family search communities um, through the family search um, kind of message boards that you can post questions and people who are a little bit more knowledgeable in those areas will offer suggestions. So I definitely encourage checking out those as well. Those look to be all of our questions for today. So thanks again, John, for joining us and sharing so much of your knowledge with us. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope again to see you um, next month, August 14th is our next presentation on the family black sheep. Um, it's great to be presented by Judy Russell again, and I just posted a link to register for the August one. Um, there's also the link in your handout. So thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you and you're welcome. Bye everybody. <laughs>